Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. Today, we're talking all things diabetes and insulin resistance with Robbie Barbro, the co-founder of Mastering Diabetes. Robbie has his Master's of Public Health and started Mastering Diabetes as a coaching program that teaches people how to reverse insulin resistance via a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2000 and has been living a whole food, plant-based diet since 2006. His co-founder, Cyrus Kambata, is also living with type 1 diabetes, and he has his PhD in nutritional biochemistry. Together, they have created Mastering Diabetes to help show the world that you can thrive with diabetes, and you can even, in certain cases, reverse it. Their book, Mastering Diabetes, just launched this week, so Robbie is here to share some tips from that on how to master diabetes through your diet and lifestyle. If you or someone you love is pre-diabetic, has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, I highly recommend checking out this book, and we'll even be giving away a free copy of it to one lucky listener. Just head over to my Instagram, at Maria Marlowe, and there are details on how you can win a free copy of this excellent book. Before we get started, check out these brands that make the Happier and Healthier podcast possible. If you're looking for better health and especially better digestion, then you have to check out my favorite probiotic brand, Hyperbiotics. Digestive health is the root of our overall health and it's so important to get it under control and get it healthy, not just so you're not embarrassed with gas and bloating or constantly running to the bathroom or maybe never running to the bathroom because you're constipated, It is so important that we nourish our gut and take care of our gut because when it's not healthy and it's not working properly, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing other health problems, whether that's skin problems, autoimmune problems, and lower immunity because our digestive system is so intricately linked with our immune system and so much more. So if you're having digestive issues currently, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, Of course, definitely check with your doctor, but you probably also want to look into a probiotic. Ravi, thanks so much for being here. I am so excited to be talking with you. I know we have a lot of fun stuff to cover. Yes. So first, before we dive into the book and and diabetes, I have to comment on the wall behind you, which is covered with an amazing array of tropical fruit. How much fruit are you eating a day, Karen? Can you tell us a little bit about your fruit collection here? I love that you're asking this question because a lot of people, you know, if they look on Instagram or they see a picture of me and my my fruit rack, they're like, that is a ton of food. Like, how can you possibly eat all of that? And I like to educate people that it is, it's misleading. It looks like a lot of food. Really, it's a lot of water. So the food that I'm eating here is very high in water content. So it's a lot of water and a lot of fiber. It's It's tons of fruits. And also, I have a ripening cycle. So all the food that you might see behind, you know, behind me or on a, you know, a fruit rack picture um, is food in different cycles. So bananas need to ripen. So I have a lot of green bananas behind me. I have a jackfruit behind me. That's going to take three or four days to ripen. There's mangoes that are different stages of ripeness. So it's really a cycle. And when you choose to eat a lot of fruit-based meals, you do have to, you know, put some effort into planning that and making sure you always have enough. And I like to also share with friends and neighbors. I shop at the wholesale market so I can get things for quite cheap. I mean, this morning I just bought a 40 pound box of ripe bananas for $8. I got a 11 like pound a, box of this organic like bananas. Price. That's like the same price at uh, the health food store for one one bunch of bananas. <laughs> Absolutely. And I got 11 pounds of organic bell peppers for $4. I mean, you pay that much for one bell pepper. So I get a lot um, and I put stuff in the fridge. I put stuff in the freezer. And of course, I eat a lot. So 
Um, I'm a big fan of abundance. It's a big thing we talk about a lot of mastering diabetes. You get to eat more and weigh less when you're eating calorie dilute foods. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes because you have type one diabetes Correct. and you seem to be thriving. So first, can you tell us what does life look like for most type one diabetics? And then secondly, why do you think you're, you're doing so well and you seem to be so healthy and you're okay. mastering diabetes? Absolutely. So the distinction between type one and type two diabetes is that people living with type two have impaired insulin production, okay? So something has happened, we don't know the exact cause of type one diabetes, but something has happened where the beta cells inside the pancreas have been destructed and do not produce sufficient quantities of insulin. So people living with type one diabetes, we inject insulin to eat food. So anytime we wanna have a meal, we're gonna inject a little bit of insulin to match the glucose, or the carbohydrate content that is in the food we're eating. And we also inject basal insulin that works as sort of like a drip feed all throughout the day to give our cells the energy it needs. So insulin is responsible for taking glucose out of your bloodstream into your cells. And that needs to happen on a 24-hour basis. So people living with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, that's initially characterized by producing too much insulin. So they're living with insulin resistance and their pancreas needs to keep on spitting out more and more and more insulin to compensate for insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is when your cells are, have basically the diminished ability of glucose to get into your cells. I mean, that's basically insulin resistance. So the body has to work harder and harder and harder to sort of force the glucose into cells. And eventually, people living with type 2 diabetes can get, essentially become insulin dependent because their pancreas gets exhausted and they're not producing enough insulin any longer. So Life with type 1 diabetes, it can be very difficult. It absolutely can be very difficult. But the Mastering Diabetes Method, which we cover in our, our book here, really teaches people how to gain full control of life with all forms of diabetes. But there is definitely a, a big focus here on people living with insulin-dependent diabetes because both Cyrus and I are living with type 1 diabetes. So the key factor that makes it so I can feel healthy, have an active life, have a high level of insulin sensitivity, is the fact that the foods we are eating are low-fat, plant-based, whole foods. So each of those phrases is really key here. So the main, I'm, I'm jumping around here because there's a lot to cover to answer that question, but I want, these are all important topics. So insulin resistance, okay, we just covered that briefly, okay? That, that's the title of the book, The Revolutionary Method to Reverse Insulin Resistance Permanently in Type 1, Type 1.5, Type 2, Prediabetes, and Gestational Diabetes. So insulin resistance is the main topic that we are talking about here. And it's also quite relevant for PCOS, which I'm sure many of your listeners are probably familiar with. So what we're doing here with the Master Diabetes Method is we are addressing insulin resistance and the causes of it at every single level, Okay. Yeah, let me just stop you. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. So before you get into the whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet, can you just share what is the common dietary guidelines or what are the common dietary guidelines for people living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes? So the American Diabetes Association is pretty, pretty much in the middle, okay? They're not going to be like, hey, go super low carb or go super high carb. They're going to be in the middle of like, oh, I just have a general maybe 30% of calories from fat, um, you know, and, and some, roughly around there for the, the main focus of fat percentages. Um, now, in general, when it comes to people who are looking, hey, I want, to, I want to control my diabetes, I want to do an alternative solution, the main thing that pops up is people like, oh, I'm going to do a low-carbohydrate diet because I have high blood glucose levels. So in order to not see my blood glucose meter have a high number, I should stop eating carbohydrates. I should stop eating glucose. So the, really the general consensus is just eat a low carbohydrate diet. You'll lower your A1C. You'll see better blood glucose readings. And what we're presenting in this book is really the exact opposite. Okay. So yeah. So let's explain yeah. that a little bit more. Exactly. So, and I know, I know it's, it's very counterintuitive. It really is. So it's like, wait a minute, you're living with diabetes. You're living with type one diabetes and you're eating pounds and pounds of fruit every day. Like that's a lot of sugar. That, sh that should cause you to inject a lot of insulin. 
that should cause your blood glucose to be variable and go up and down and just be a disaster. So let's go back to the focus on, on type 1 diabetes here. So people, when I first got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, I was 12, just about to turn 13. So I've had it for almost 20 years now. And so at that point, I was doing a standard American diet, nothing really special. And I injected probably, you know, just a normal average amount of insulin. A healthy human pancreas is going to secrete somewhere between maybe 25-ish to 50 units of total insulin per day. So over the years, I tried many different diets. And one of the key diets I tried was a plant-based ketogenic diet. So I ate a very small amount of, of carbohydrates. So about 30 grams of total carbohydrate per day. All right. And at that point, I was injecting a, quite a small amount of insulin. Okay. So it was about 10 units a day. So you'd calculate that as a three to one 24 hour carbohydrate insulin ratio. Okay. So for every three grams of glucose I consume, I would inject one unit of insulin. All right. Then as I transitioned to a a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet, I now consume over 700 grams of carbohydrate on many days. You can see it on my Instagram story highlights if you want to see everything I'm eating and documenting all the numbers. And I'm injecting somewhere between, you know, 25 and 30-ish units of insulin. So the 24-hour carbohydrate insulin ratio becomes like 25-ish to one. We're talking about a 600% change in insulin sensitivity doing the exact opposite of what people have been taught to do. Again, getting into the type 1 diabetes nuances here, what's really powerful is that people living with type 1 diabetes often wear continuous glucose monitors. So these are devices that we attach to our stomach or our arm or our leg, and via Bluetooth technology, it communicates with our cell phone and tells us our blood glucose number every five minutes. So people living with type 1 diabetes, we get to see the curve uh, after our meals, okay, hey, you just ate, you know, some mangoes, some, some sabadilla, some raspberries, some arugula. W what happened? What was that curve? And we get to see that repeatedly. And so what we've also established in the type 1 community is this idea of called time in range, okay? So time in range is how much of a 24-hour period you spend with your blood glucose between 70 and 180. So that's the consensus for type 1 diabetes. That's a good range that we want to stay in. Now, people who are, have a pancreas that's functioning properly, you'll have a tighter range. You're never seeing a blood glucose of 170 because your pancreas is working perfectly. So, but in general, that's the range. So people living with type 1 diabetes, following you know, standard diets and whatnot, they're roughly in range about you know, 50 to 70%. That's, what, that's what's going on. I'm showing every day on Instagram what's happening with my time and range, and my 90-day average is 89%. So again, these are nitty gritty details that might not apply unless you really understand type 1 diabetes. But the point is I'm trying to make here is that I'm showing, and it's not just me. It's we have hundreds and hundreds of clients, thousands of people, if you include pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, who are having the same results. And the point I'm saying is they have the data to show that these foods are not causing blood glucose spikes. They are not requiring me to use more insulin. As a matter of fact, they require me to use less insulin than anybody would ever imagine for how much carbohydrate I'm consuming. And the standard deviation, like the volatility of my blood glucose is absolutely excellent. It's just as good as people who are doing a low carbohydrate diet. And for a lot of people, it's just mind blowing. It, it doesn't make sense until you start to understand the science and the research and all the components which address insulin resistance. So a low-fat diet is part of it. That's one component. It's the biggest component. But there's also the idea of what happens when you reduce your heme iron consumption. What happens when you reduce your sodium consumption? What happens when you're increasing your fiber intake? What happens when you're moving your body more? What happens when you're incorporating insulin or uh, intermittent fasting? So these are all a lot of the variables that are important for addressing insulin sensitivity. And the Master in Diabetes Method addresses each and every single one. Yeah. And that's a great reminder. I think very often when we think of illness or an issue, we think there's, or we hope there's one key, key issue. It's just diet or it's just the fruit or it's just one food group, but often it's really, there's a number of different factors that come into play. Yes. 
Absolutely. So then let's just start before we go into the details of the science behind it. I'd love to get a better idea of what you're eating day to day. Like what does a normal day look like for you food wise? Yeah. So I'll answer that for me personally, so people can know. And then I also just want to explain what we teach at, at large. So I personally, I love fruit. I just absolutely love fruit. I live in Santa Monica, California. I can access amazing local fruit and I can get a lot of great imports at the Los Angeles wholesale market. So I eat from basically four food groups here. I eat fruits, I eat leafy greens, I eat non-starchy vegetables, and I eat nuts and seeds. So I keep it very simple, but the real guideline here is the focus that all those foods are in our green light category. So at Master Diabetes, we put food into a green light, yellow light, red light category. And green light foods include, they can fruits, starchy vegetables, beans, intact whole grains, leafy greens, non-starchy vegetables, herbs and spices, and mushrooms. I also do eat mushrooms, so I should include that. But those are the foods that we're teaching people to eat ad libitum, to eat as much as when they're hungry until they're satisfied, focus on those whole foods in their intact form, and that will help people maximize their insulin sensitivity. So I will typically eat, like for breakfast this morning, I had mango, I had sapodilla, I had raspberries, and I had arugula. For lunch today, I'll probably have um, some persimmons. I'll probably have some mangoes. I uh, have some white sapote here. Um, and then I have a, a snack before dinner. It's usually wild blueberries, mangoes, bell peppers, arugula, stuff like that. And then dinner is a big salad where I have you know, romaine lettuce, tomatoes, onions, papaya, mangoes, stuff like that. So it's pretty simple. Um, each meal is, I don't really have that many ingredients, but the key thing is that everything is whole intact. So for people living with insulin resistance, these are important nuances to address. So things like smoothies, they're good. They're, they're full of healthy ingredients, but if you're living with insulin resistance and you're trying to manage that blood glucose elevation that's happening, eating whole food and chewing it is going to be important. Same thing when it comes to you know, food's being a little more processed. If you're going to eat rice or something, it's better to have brown rice than brown rice pasta. Brown rice pasta is great, but we have this huge emphasis on the green light category being nothing but truly whole, intact, unprocessed foods. Right. So I'm curious about the arugula. Are you literally just eating the arugula or are you putting some dressing on there? <laughs> I literally just eat the arugula. <laughs> he has I a bowl of it. arugula. It's so good. And there's, I mean... Again, I'm super lucky that I have access to all this stuff, but I get Bloomsdale spinach at the farmer's market. I mean, there's a green called sorrel, which is really sweet. There's sword lettuce. I get black-seeded Simpson lettuce, Vulcan lettuce. I mean, there's at least 10 different varieties of lettuce I can get at the farmer's market. And I wish and hope for a world where these produce varieties are available everywhere because people are demanding them and they want these things in their grocery store you know, versus demanding, you know, more processed food. Right. So I'm curious, your diet seems like it's primarily fruit. And you mentioned that you eat four, mainly four food groups or five with the mushrooms, but yet you do recommend it as part of the green light category, a wider range of food. So why yeah. the difference? So, you know, for me, it's just become a habit. I've been doing this now, eating nothing but fruits and vegetables, these simple foods for 13 years. And the reason I got into this whole thing, the reason I pursued this is because I went on a mission to do anything and everything I possibly could to reverse type one diabetes, which is a solution we do not have. There is no repeatable, reliable solution for how to, for somebody to get their beta cells to start producing insulin once again. So that was my mission. I came into this saying, hey, look, that somebody has to be the first to do anything. I mean, Roger Bannister was the first person to run the four-minute mile. Before that happened, the smartest people in the world says that's not possible. And now many people run four-minute mile. He showed what's possible, and now other human beings are doing it. So I do believe at some point we are going to figure out a natural solution for people living with insulin-dependent diabetes to get their pancreas to produce insulin once again, to get those beta cells regenerated, rejuvenated, and, and operating again. But I haven't figured that out yet. So the reason I got to this very, very clean, specific diet is I was initially trying to just do anything I possibly could 
to lessen the load on my digestive system. So when we go to bed at night, we're basically, we, everybody does a fast every day. It's when you go to bed. And then you eat breakfast. You break your fast. And we all know that healing and regeneration happens when your body is given that break. So digestion is one of the most energy intensive activities in the body. So the mentality was like, hey, if I can just eat foods that are much easier on my digestive system, then my body can use that energy to do some healing, to do some repairing. So that was the mentality. And I was just laser focused. I mean, just like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I started a Facebook group for my friends. I was like, watch me reverse type 1 diabetes. Things were going so well in the beginning as I was improving my insulin sensitivity and eating all these you know, fruits and then needing less and less insulin. I'm like, man, what, this is exciting. This is going to happen. I'm just going to keep on going down and on down. And unfortunately, you know, it hit a plateau and I, I require insulin just like everybody else living with insulin dependent diabetes. So to answer your question, it's just become a habit. It's, it's the way of life. I, I like it. I enjoy it. And I, I do, one thing I'm a big advocate of is each person you know, looking themselves in the mirror and deciding what are my bright lines? Where am I going to draw a line? What, what, what do I eat? What do I not eat? And try and stick to it consistently, whatever that is. You know, some people might want to add in, you know, a little bit of these of treats here or there. Like, oh, that's okay. I'm happy to have that, you know, once a week or whatever, twice a week. Just be clear with yourself. Set those, those boundaries and, and stick with it to get your goals, to achieve the goals that you're looking to achieve. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about the specifics of the food. I'm curious, you mentioned treats. So what are your thoughts on some of these sweeteners like coconut sugar or stevia or monk fruit? Are those things that, or dates, well, obviously dates are a fruit, but are those things that people can include with diabetes? Or So ideally, we want to encourage people to steer away from those, but like dates would be a great sweetener. So taking dates, you know, blending them up, that can be a great sweetener. But in general, yeah, we want people to reactivate their taste buds. So stevia is cool, like it's good. It's not really bad. It's not really a problem. But the one downside is that it's so concentrated that it sort of inhibits your ability to enjoy the natural sugars in fruits. It's like you kind of like expect that, that big hit. So it's just something to be cognizant of. But, you know, it's a great question. And there are a lot of nuances around this. And that is, you know, why we created a coaching program. So that's why Cyrus and I launched this whole thing, because we knew that people were going to have very nuanced questions that are specific to them and their tastes and their flavors. And, you know, what does it take to stick to an overall healthy diet? If, some, if people are feeling too restrictive, like, wait, you tell me I can't have stevia? Like, like screw you, I'm not doing this. You know what I mean? Like, there's, there's going to be a different um, level of, of what's going to be included, not included for each individual. But in general, again, we're just going to try and steer people towards Whole maximizing food. their green light, consumption, green light consumption. Got it. And can you talk a little bit about fat? So what is it about fat that causes issues in the diet and with insulin resistance? Yeah. Okay. So particularly saturated fat is the biggest culprit here. But what's happening is when people are living with insulin resistance, the primary issue is that fat too much fat has accumulated in cells that are not designed to store fat, okay? Adipose tissue is designed to store fat, okay? Your muscle and liver cells are designed to store only a small amount of fat. But when you consume too much, it ends up getting stored in there, and fat has an easy entry. So fat can get into muscle and liver cells very easily, whereas glucose, it needs insulin. It has a, it's a more challenging pathway to get in there. So what happens is when people consume too much fat in general, they end up gaining weight and they start storing this fat in tissues that are not designed to store fat, insulin receptors do not work properly. So that is what prevents insulin from being able to open the door. So you then are, you know, you go and you're living with diabetes, you eat a banana and the, your body's trying to take the glucose from the banana into the cells, but it's, the cell says no. <laughs> I'm full. I'm overloaded. I can't. I can't accept the glucose right now. So it ends up floating around in the bloodstream. And people say, hey, the banana led to me having a high blood glucose reading. Like, how can you argue with that? 
I just had a banana. I had two bananas. I tested myself and my number's 300. It's supposed to be between, you know, 80 and, and 120-ish. Like, what's going on? How can you tell me it wasn't the banana? And the problem is, it's the, the banana's the innocent bystander. The real issue here is that your insulin is not being able to open the door. And that's why the glucose is stuck inside your bloodstream. So what are your thoughts on this whole keto diet trend? Yeah, so that's very fascinating on a lot of levels. And there's also, you know, I want to acknowledge there's like a plant-based keto world and then there's, you know, an animal-based keto world. So I primarily want to talk about animal-based ketogenic diets first. So the issue here is that, number one, they're very high in saturated fat, so that's problematic. They're very low in fiber, animal-based ketogenic diets. So those are big problems. But when it comes to diabetes, here's the, here's the issue. People are getting fantastic results. You cannot argue with the results. You go look on the internet, you see the before and after pictures, you see the, the blood test results, you see that people are getting off diabetes medications, they're lowering their A1C into a non-diabetic range. These are, they're fantastic results. But the concern that we have is that they are eating themselves into a state of higher levels of insulin resistance. They are making themselves glucose intolerant. So if they try and eat a banana or two, if they try and eat a carton of blueberries, they see their blood glucose skyrocket. Like the people who are doing a true, true keto diet really are keeping it to about 30 grams or less of carbohydrate per day, maybe 50. Some people can have a little bit of a higher tolerance. But what's happening is you are now limiting what has been shown to be some of the healthiest foods that we know. You're limiting your consumption of fruits, you're limiting your consumption of intact whole grains, limiting your consumption of beans, lentils, peas, starchy fruits like potatoes. Those are foods that are all being limited now. And you are now glucose intolerant, which there is no society which has ever lived that has shown that that is going to result in long-term health. We don't know. There aren't any long-term studies. Like the longest study I'm aware of is five years. There isn't epidemiological research to look at, hey, what happens to large groups of people who do this for an extended period of time? So the short-term numbers are good. Nobody's going to deny that. But the short-term number that's not good is insulin sensitivity. And as a person living with type 1 diabetes, I can confirm that through my own experience and through hundreds and hundreds of people we've worked with. We are amazing test subjects for this very important topic. And the reason we're great test subjects is because we know how much insulin we're injecting, we count our carbohydrate consumption, and we measure our blood glucose consistently, many of us having 24-hour data. So those three pieces of data mean that we can truly assess our insulin sensitivity meal by meal. Unfortunately, you can't do that. You don't know how much insulin your pancreas secreted based on the meal you just ate. You're not sure. And you're likely not testing your blood glucose levels. So people living with type 1 diabetes, we have this data, and I have never seen not a single exception. There are a few things in the world of health that you can just say absolutely 100%. And insulin sensitivity in people living with type 1 diabetes is absolutely one of these things where I can say 100%. As people increase their carbohydrate consumption, eat more whole carbohydrate foods while simultaneously reducing their fat intake, they will need less insulin for more total grams of carbohydrate. And I, look, I've been deep down this path. Any of the skeptics want to say, oh, well, you're increasing your fiber consumption or you're increasing your fructose consumption, which may or may not require insulin. Okay, fine, no problem. Take those numbers out. I do this every day on my Instagram account. And I will I use chronometer to tell people how much glucose I'm consuming, just straight glucose. So you calculate that by you look at how much sucrose did you consume and you divide it by two, because that's half glucose, half fructose. Then you take the glucose number, and then you take the starch number. Take those three numbers in any nutrition analytics software, and you will know exactly how much glucose you consume. And we can do this for any single type one. I mean, there's millions of us out there and anybody can test it within days. Within days, they will see that what we're saying is absolutely true. And, and it's mind blowing. And we do this at our four day retreats. I've never had a type one come to a retreat. We probably have well over 100 people come to our retreat at this point. Um, not see them, their insulin sensitivity improve 
on a, a low fat plant based whole food diet. So this, I mean, it sounds incredible. You obviously have hundreds, if not more, uh, testimonials for, for eating this way for type one. The thing, because I'm always thinking of what, what are people listening thinking? And I'm sure a question that's popping up is, oh, well, what about a little bit of animal products? What's so wrong with the animal products? Why do we need to cut those out? What if we're 90% plant-based and 10% animal? So, I mean, what I would say to that person, if I was like working with them personally and how we work with clients is I would say, look, it's up to you and your goals and what you want to achieve. And for people living with type one diabetes, I can let them fill out this thing called the decision tree, which is one of the four components of the mastering diabetes method. And that will give them the data to see what's going on with their insulin sensitivity and their blood glucose management. So we tell people, look, go ahead and experiment. And if you are okay with the results that happen, then that's your choice. That's your choice. There's no doubt that a a predominantly plant-based diet is what we're looking for people to achieve. So I am a bigger picture person. Um, I studied public health, got my master's in public health, trying to help a lot of people. So I would just, I would not stress about it. I'd be like, look, if that's what works for you and you think that's important to you, I'm not going to get in the nuances. I'm not going to argue. Like you can find research that shows there's some concerns with some small amounts of animal products. But if that's important to you, things are working for you, your gut microbiome is in good shape, I- I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to like get into the weeds about this small change. I just want people to achieve their goals. I want people living with all forms of diabetes to reduce or eliminate unnecessary medications. And if a 90% plant-based diet is helping them achieve that goal, then go for it. Right. Yeah. And I think it's always great to emphasize the fact that each of us is different and our bodies are different. Our goals are different. And so we need to find the right diet that works for us. And the best way to do that is to experiment, experiment, see how you feel. See if you're living with type one diabetes, you have some real hard data as well. And then you can make those decisions. No question. No question. And again, I I can't emphasize it enough. Don't get lost in little weeds, little nuances focus on the bigger picture. I mean, like, look at what's happening in our culture, the amount of money we're spending on people who are struggling with diabetes when it's just not necessary. If they got to a 90% whole food plant-based diet, like we would solve so many problems. It's incredible. Right. So we talked a lot about type one. Let's talk a little bit about type two, because that's generally something that develops later on at some point in your life. What are some of the warning signs for type 2 diabetes? And is there any connection between age and diabetes or genetics and and type 2 diabetes? Or is it all primarily diet lifestyle based? So unfortunately, young children are starting to get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So initially, type 1 was called juvenile onset diabetes. And then type 2 was adult onset diabetes. There was juvenile diabetes and adult onset. And they have now changed that. So you have type one, because unfortunately, also older people are getting diagnosed with type one diabetes. But really, the really sad part is to see young children. I mean, we're talking like grade school, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, people living with type two diabetes. It's very sad. So there is a a small genetic component. But I think the bigger component is the the fact that what's passed down from generation to generation is lifestyle habits, is eating habits. That's really the biggest component here. And so it's really the, what's happening is for most people, it's, it's excess weight, excess visceral fat is leading to insulin resistance. Fat stored in tissues that are not designed to store fat has basically made the mechanism of insulin opening the doors not work. And it truly is that simple. So you definitely can find research where as long as people just lose weight, even if they lose weight on a low carbohydrate diet, you will see improvements in insulin sensitivity. You will see improvements in diabetes metrics, A1C, um, fasting blood glucose, even glucose tolerance a little bit, just by losing weight. So that is a huge component. And again, the reason the mastering diabetes is effective is a lot of reasons, but including people living with type 2 diabetes can lose weight quite easily and maintain that weight loss because it's a diet of abundance rather than restriction. So 
that's a key thing that we focus on at Master Diabetes is long-term health. Anybody can do something in the short term with willpower, but you've got to have a program, a way of living that really works with your life for the long term. It's easy, it's graceful, it's enjoyable, it's affordable. These are really important things in order for people to stick to it. So basically, type 2 diabetes, in the vast majority of cases, can be reversed. Now, there are people, like I said earlier, they have had type 2 diabetes for a long time. Their pancreas has been secreting excess insulin to compensate for insulin resistance for 10, 20, 30 years. And eventually, the beta cells get exhausted and they just can't do it anymore and they essentially die off. And you can get a test to measure how well your pancreas is secreting insulin or how much insulin your pancreas is secreting. So, I mean, fasting insulin tests can help with that, but also a C-peptide test. So C-peptide is produced in a one-to-one -one ratio when insulin is produced, and then they break off. Insulin does its job, and C-peptide kind of floats around and does nothing, but it's in the bloodstream for an extended period of time, which makes it easier to test. So you can get to that point where you're living with insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes, and that's okay. It's, not a, it's no big deal. You just have to start using a small amount of insulin to try and compensate for what your pancreas is no longer secreting. So people living with type 1 diabetes and insulin-dependent type 2 and also type 1.5, our goal is to inject the same amount of insulin our pancreas would have normally secreted before the beta cells stop working properly. That's the goal. And there's a lot of fear in the, in just the health world about insulin being the enemy. And if I inject insulin, I'm going to gain weight. And that's absolutely not true. Excess insulin will lead to weight gain, but a appropriate amount of insulin is not going to lead to weight gain. It's an essential, necessary hormone. Every single human, like your dog, your cat, produces insulin in order for you to survive. So pre-diabetes, I would say is reversible in pretty much 100% of cases. So this is where you have not gotten to full-blown type 2. All right, so your, your A1C level, your fasting blood glucose level has not gotten into that, you know, 6.5% or above is going to put you in the type 2 category. Pre-diabetes is your 5.7 to 6.4. That's your A1C range. It's going to put you in the pre-diabetes category. 5.6% or below means you're non-diabetic. So again, pre-diabetes, it has not gotten to the point where your, um, your A1C is too high, and you're basically producing a good amount of insulin at that point. If you're living with prediabetes, your pancreas is not completely exhausted yet. So the point at that, at that point, you gotta ask yourself, my body's producing plenty of insulin. My pancreas, my beta cells are still functioning properly. What do I have to do to make that insulin work efficiently? What do I have to do to stop taxing my pancreas to prevent it from getting to that point where it's just absolutely exhausted and I could eventually become insulin dependent or I could need more diabetes medications. That's the question you got to ask yourself. And that's the fun part that Cyrus and myself and all of us type ones are experiencing is that we get through our living example, we get to show people living with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes every single day, every single meal, how to make insulin work more efficiently. It's undeniable, unarguable, there is no question. You can look at any type one, you can watch them inject the insulin, you can watch them eat the food, have them show you their blood glucose profile, you can watch it on my Instagram and plenty of other Instagrams, and there is no denying that this approach, this way of living, is gonna maximize insulin's ability to take glucose out of your bloodstream into your cells. So you're living with pre-diabetes, you have elevated fasting blood glucose. Trying to ask yourself, okay, how do I reduce that elevated glucose? How do I make it so the glucose is not sitting in my bloodstream and it goes into my cells where it belongs so my cells can get fueled and function properly and I can feel amazing and live my best life? The answer to that question is to adopt the mastering diabetes method, <laughs> okay? A low-fat plant-based whole food diet, you gotta move your body, you can incorporate intermittent fasting, and you're going to use decision trees to document what you are doing. 
Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And I know from your Instagram and your site and everything, it, it is just really incredible to watch so many people actually thriving with diabetes, because I think when most of us think of diabetes, we don't necessarily thriving is not usually the thought that comes to mind. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I just want to add real quick, just because I'm so passionate about this topic, <laughs> that this idea of reducing your consumption of fat in order to improve your insulin sensitivity, this dates back to the 1920s. So Dr. Sansom published an article in JAMA in 1926 showing that as his patients ate more carbohydrate-rich food, then number one, they didn't need more insulin. So that was number one. And number two, a lot of their, the struggles that they were having on a low-carbohydrate diet disappeared. So they returned to normal physical activity. So, okay, let me take a step back here. Insulin was discovered in the 1920s, okay? So prior to that, people who were living with, you know, insulin-dependent diabetes or even diabetes in general were advised to follow a low-carbohydrate diet. That's the only thing they could do because if they didn't have enough insulin production, you're really you're at a loss at that point. So once they discovered insulin, they could help people who had impaired insulin production and wait, wait a minute, okay, what can we do here to try and give them a higher quality of life and help them manage their blood glucose levels? So Dr. Sanson was one of the first to experiment with people eating more carbohydrate-rich food. He added fruit to their diet. He added potatoes and he added bread, which were foods that were just not allowed prior to the use of insulin if you're living with any form of diabetes. It just wouldn't work. And so he added those foods and now they, like, their blood glucose management was just fine. Their cardiovascular health improved. The diet was more palatable. It was cheaper. They had reduced cravings. And it was, it was a real eye-opener, okay? And then in the 1930s, you have Dr. Hemsworth, and he's conducting elegant studies where they would do what's called, it was basically a test where they would, in, they can't do it anymore because it's not that safe. But they would inject insulin and they would see how far down would somebody's blood glucose go? Like, how, where, where would we drive it to? And he found out that when people ate a low-fat diet, insulin worked faster and it drove their blood glucose down lower. And he did this consistently. And this is the 1930s. And he would, he would like conclude one study. He says, whilst on the high carbohydrate diet, the glucose tolerance was raised. And so he also said, this is one of my favorite quotes. It is demonstrated that the efficiency with which a standard dose of crystalline insulin acts on the blood sugar is determined by the carbohydrate content of the diet. So that the greater the amount of carbohydrate in the diet, the greater the sensitivity of the organism to insulin. So this is research dating back to the 1930s. And they continued to be finding the same thing over and over and over again. And we cover all this in the book. But the point I'm just trying to make is, we're not basing everything we're saying on our personal stories. I know that's what we've talked about a lot today. Everything we are experiencing is coming from, is basically corroborating with evidence-based research, almost 100 years of evidence-based research with nothing to the contrary. So in this book, we have over 800 citations. We dug through the research, looking at all sides. We have a whole chapter comparing the ketogenic diet to the low-fat diet, looking at the details of the scientific research. And when you dig deep into the studies, you will, any study where people were fed a plant-based diet, where there was no more than 15% of calories coming from fat, the result was improved insulin sensitivity, lower blood glucose levels, lower A1C across the board. I've yet to see an exception. And so we cover a lot of those studies in the book. But the point is that there's confusion in the research about what is a low-fat diet. So you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, hey, I'm, um, you know, the low-fat diet compared to low-carbohydrate diet, low-carbohydrate diet performed better. And in those studies, invariably, they were doing a low-fat diet of 26% of calories from fat, 30, 35. So you really have to dig into the research and understand what type of low-fat diet was studied. And so the Mastering Diabetes Method, we're teaching people no more than 15% of calories from fat again, because that's what the research shows is effective. And we're also saying, you know, another guideline is no more than 30 grams of fat per day. And in the book, we also go into mad detail about fat-soluble vitamins. How much fat do you need per meal to absorb those, those vitamins? And what does the research show? 
So in short, the answer is not that much. And you get more than enough when you're eating a 15% of calories coming from fat or 30 grams. It's really, really fascinating. So the book Mastering Diabetes is out this week. Congratulations on that. If anyone listening is living with diabetes, has prediabetes, or has a family member that has any of these issues, definitely pick up a copy. I'm sure you'll find it very, very informative and beneficial. Thank so, you so Robbie, much. one last question I like to ask all my guests. If there is just one tip or piece of advice you can leave our listeners to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Okay, so my one tip is, again, just going along with what we've been talking about today and what we're so passionate about doing with helping people is just become aware of how much total fat you consume per day. Use a nutrition software. Again, it's not about judging yourself or having to make changes or whatever. Just start with one question. How many grams of fat do I eat on a daily basis? And start there. And I think people are going to be very intrigued and surprised to find that it's a lot more than they think they're having. That's a really interesting tip. I'm curious, since you said this, for someone who's not living with diabetes, is your recommendation for fat different? No, it's going to be about the same. I, I really believe that this is what, what, like the ideal way is essentially whole natural foods. I think that that's the way to go. But again, you, I mean, it's a good question. And I think at that point, you don't really have as much motivation and it, doesn't, it might not matter as much. So I think there would be more room for flexibility. But again, it really depends on what somebody's goals are. But I, I, the answer, the short answer is, the short answer is yes. I really, if I didn't have diabetes, I would be doing the same thing. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Ravi. This has been really insightful. And yeah, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, we're giving one lucky listener a copy of Mastering Diabetes for free. In order to enter, simply head over to Instagram at Healthy by Marlo. And Marlo is M-A-R-L-O-W-E with details on how to win.